Joining, joining me today on the Uniweb interview show, Blaze Ramsey, John Sinkle, owners of Fireside Publishing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No problem. My pleasure. At first, I thought you guys were wearing the same T-shirt, but it's just similar colors. Um, are they like they look like softball T-shirts of some some sort, like a team? Uh, we are a team. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so Fireside Publishing. This is your this is your baby. This is something that you created uh, in the past year, correct? Yeah, yep. yeah, now it's more like a toddler, and it acts that way, too. <laughs> is it almost getting into the terrible twos, right? We are. Yep. So how did Fireside Publishing uh, come about? That is an interesting story. Um, I tried Good. to go back to work. <laughs> I tried to go back to work four times, okay? I tried to go back to the retail world four times, and I kid you not, every single time I had to quit for something at home. Like, all three of them got sick. I had to take four days off. Um, the kids were not doing well. I mean, it was just, it's like, okay, you know what? I'm done. I'm not going to put out any more applications. Done. I'm so done with the retail world. So I want to work for myself so I can be home with my kids. And then he is really good at a man being a manager. So I was like, okay, how can we work together on this? And I started writing. Just randomly started writing after 15 years in conceptual art and design. Like, just out of nowhere. And the first short story I ever published won an award on the site called DeviantArt. It got a feature front page wow. by the community. And I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe I've got a future in this. So I started writing in short stories. Mm -hmm. And he is actually a big inspiration in my writing because he writes beautifully as well. He's got, <laughs> he, he does, he's got a beautiful, I see him in the mirror back there. He's got a beautiful. <laughs> writing style but anyway he was a big inspiration as well so I took place in my first uh, writing my first novel I finished it pitched it to a traditional publisher but it didn't go well I mean it was heartbreaking I, I nearly quit mm -hmm. how, with how heartbreaking it was and it wasn't because of rejection I can handle rejection but it, it was a pretty big mess they wanted to sign me and at the very end they just said oh no we're done you know we're not gonna do this for yeah it was pretty heartbreaking so I was like, okay, what can I do to recover? And then I found the world of independent publishing. And I was like, oh, thank God. I'm such a control freak. This is great. So It's, per it's perfect for us, control freaks. That's right. Oh, yeah. I, Feeds I like, are OCD, big time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> completely. I was yeah. like, no, no, no. I get to set everything I want. So then I started writing Blessing of Luna, which actually started out with a different title. So I won my first NaNoWriMo for it, which is the shirt I'm wearing right now. And um, You can win NaNoWriMo? <laughs> that's what I, I get that a lot. So it's like, I, I didn't <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Two years in a row I've won it. It's, it's wow. Been, <laughs> Very cool. It's been Are the, uh, do you have the stories available? Are they available to read, the, the two winning stories? Uh, Blessing of Luna is the first one. Okay. And the second one, second one, I'm not gonna tell. I'm not gonna tell. Under the table kind of thing. It will be released probably next year, so I'm not going to tell. But I will say it is a supernatural thriller and the beginning of an on-running series. So, okay. a little Wait bit. A of second. So I'm sorry. Let me. I just want to make sure I get this straight. So the second Nano competition you won was in 2018, last year, right? Yes. And that yes. is the story that has not yet to come out. Yes, that is the story that nobody knows about yet. It's very okay. rare. The only people that know about it probably are my uh, live readers because we do a lot of live shows. And you, and this NaNoWriMo is just a month of writing. It is, straight month. How, how long are these books? Oh, um, the Blessing of Luna was actually 95,000 words. Wow. However, I have perfected my art. Yes, I <laughs> have perfected my art. <laughs> And um, it has actually, I was actually able to cut the second book down to 75,000. So I mm -hmm. got rid of a bunch of, bunch of unneeded, bunch of unneeded stuff. Wow. So um, the second one is a supernatural thriller and it is actually an ongoing series. So okay. we think it's going to be really, really exceptionally received. Our beta what? readers seem to like it. <laughs> so, so is there like a group of people for Nan NaNoWriMo who are, are just like, yeah, this is the best thing we've seen so far. And like they, they're, they're like a panel of judges, I suppose, that, that judge the work and then call a winner? 
No, the way Nano works is you have 30 days. Well, they start winning. You start winning in 20. And what you do is you copy and paste your word count into their forum, and it will count uh, the, the word count, like 50,000 words. Huh. So um, I, for one, uh, have finished and just counted out, and um, that's how it works. You can actually wow. get winner T-shirts. I usually get winner okay. T-shirts. They send you a certificate, which I have hanging on my wall. I mean, it's it's a pretty big deal because yeah. – it begins, people are on fire, but as the month wanes on, they have to find out, oh, my God, I have to write every single day. It's Most, hard. Many drop <laughs> off. Yeah, many drop off. So those of us who have won, we get asked, how did you do this? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's – it's, and I saw I saw that uh, you wrote about how do you deal with writer's block, and I believe that's totally true. Is You can't get just, like, call in. And be like, I don't feel like writing. I think, too, it's like, am I just unwilling to write what's inside me? Because we always have something to say, right? There's always something there. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Just are we willing to put it on paper, right? Oh, yeah. And and it's there's a lot of things for writers nowadays, which is unfortunate, that they feel like they have to what's called the dreaded right to market. So yeah. they write something they really don't want to because it's popular. Right. And unfortunately, that creates burnout. So many of them fall by the wayside because of that, too. But the beauty of it is we write what we want, right. what we want to read. And one star or five star, we're gonna we're gonna tell our stories. Right. And so how how does Fireside so how did Fireside uh, come about in in the process of writing this book? Were you like, okay, I wrote a book, I put it on Amazon, published it, right? Yes. And then what happened? Well, I saw a lot of things on my social media where it was a lot of what we call in the industry uh, buy my book bashing. But for me, there was, an em there was an emptiness. There was something missing, something. I didn't want to be another, hey, buy my book. I'm awesome. I made a publishing brand. We wanted to make the company built for other people. We turned our attention outwards. So we started looking more at our reader base, at our bloggers, at other authors, and the more we focused on them, we found, okay, there was more fulfillment because we started feeling, oh, great, we're helping other people instead of just ourselves. Right. So Blessing of Luna was just one of those things that we could, we had in our hand. And we were like, hey, you know what? We did this. You can do this too. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of work. So we used it more as a marketing product rather than a marketing brand. <laughs> right. So it was like a, a way to empower other writers. Yeah, it's it's there's nothing that feels better than holding it in your hand. And we wanted to tell them that even if they decide not to publish and they just have an author copy, mm -hmm. you know, that that holding it is enough and in and of itself for me. I knew for I know for me, there was nothing better. It was like having a third child. <laughs> yeah, it it like, is. It's, <laughs> it's face. He's like, what? <laughs> It is, though, because, I mean, it is it is something that you've birthed from your mind into the real world. You've manifested it now into a physical thing. Um, what have the past two years been like for you guys in terms of building this business? How How, how is Fireside Publishing doing? Wow. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> whenever we get asked this, my head goes into surreal mode because it's been very surreal. In the span yeah. of a short, the short almost a couple of years we've had it it's exploded mm. we have a loyal fan base we have we have we are connected in into our our conventions that we attend we've met people that are in charge of them and they've contacted us and keep in contact with us and it's it's just it's been a network that's just exploded really mm. really big so our name is becoming recognized yeah. when like oh yeah i know you fireside i know you you were here last year and it's like so our readers actually make it to come by our table and say are we getting the sequel anytime soon are y'all accepting submissions yet when's the anthology supposed to come out like bukus of questions in these live shows and awesome. yeah it's exploded we can't we can't explain how explosive this thing has become so what's the day-to-day -day like for you all I mean, is this a, is this a daily grind, John? Can you speak to kind of what you all you all have to do on a daily basis? Well, honestly, I don't get to see much of what she does mainly because usually my daily grind is at work, um, mm. work outside the house. But the few days I'm off, normally she'll be uh, writing for either herself or multiple clients going through, and um, she'll have blogs that she'll be 
getting stuff set up for social media you know, schedules that she'll be creating. And honestly, she has a planner <laughs> of control freaks. <laughs> of that I'm organized. Look at that. So control. <laughs> it's a thing of whenever our kids are at school, she is pretty much going from the time she gets up to the time she picks them up. And even once they're down, then she gets back to it. And wherever I'm able to uh, help out when I get home or my days off, it might be whether it's I'm right for myself or um, like web design, just little technical pieces here or there. So normally we don't get much time for gaming or other activities, other hobbies, but we just we're able to relax and do this. We're able to grow fireside and that is actually relaxing because it's almost like it's not a job. Yeah. Yeah. When you build, when you're building something you're passionate about, there's a lot that goes into um, building a confidence in other people, right? They want to see that what you're putting out is going to be valuable to them. Um, in terms of in terms of how you're marketing your business, I mean, what, how are you going about? You, I heard you say conventions, so you've been going to conventions for writing, or uh, can you speak on that a little bit? See, that's the funny thing. We don't go to writing conventions. When okay. we go to book related conventions, we find our audience is actually lower than we go and when we go to conventions that has to do with cosplay or uh, comics or uh, like. Have you heard of a uh, Acon per chance? Acon, yeah, not not the rapper. I was gonna say no. I haven't we heard that. I know <laughs> the, I know the rapper, but uh, like using Acon as an example, it is supposed to be the largest anime convention here in the United States. Okay, uh, if I'm correctly. That being said, if we go to different writing conventions, you're gonna be there with a lot of other authors, and people okay. are gonna be like, okay, well. Let's go look at, we know this person, we know this person, we don't really know you. Maybe we will want to get to know you, maybe we won't. But say like Alcon, which has a little bit of sci-fi, a little bit of high fantasy, just different things that people are there for. I mean, like Power Rangers, for example. But they see an author and it's like, hey, you write? That, that's what I want to do. How, how can I do that? Right. And they'll just come up and just start connecting with them as people. And if they want to... If they want to buy something from us, cool. If they want to just network with us, that's even better. So, I think it's it, it's interesting that we do uh, get caught in a mindset of of networking, and we always end up networking with other writers. But in terms of like connecting with fans of of just who want to read sci fi or fantasy, it's like where do we go? But then that it makes so much sense that you go to like a Comic Con or a Con, like you said, or um, mm -hmm. and seek out the people who love fiction. Yeah. Yeah. They, and then it's crazy. easy from there, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not everyone's like, oh, I read specifically sci science fantasy. Okay, that's all I read. Now, a lot of people be like, this is why I like to read, but then I'll read other things. It's like music right. as well. So, mm -hmm. there they, they, are people out there looking to fall in love with worlds and characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yep. definitely, um, yep. they're, they're fun to talk to. And it's, it's really amazing how often they've just come to us and said, uh, Hey, do you like this? Like, I, I'm I'm not ashamed to say I'm a big Witcher fan. <laughs> yeah. So the last convention I went to, there was a there was a guy dressed as Geralt. Geralt, um, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. like, I was like, no, you're not leaving my table. You're standing right here. <laughs> <laughs> Witcher. <laughs> oh my gosh, I couldn't let him go, and I said, I'm sorry. You probably think I'm the biggest whatever you think I'm I am, but I can't stop hugging you. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, it's okay. I'm glad. This is why I like to dress this way. I'm like, mm -hmm. you're not leaving my table. Just stay right there. <laughs> yeah, that's where all the all the passionate passionate fans are, and that's who we want as readers. But also, like for you all, um, looking for authors. Mm -hmm. How many how many authors do you have now? Um, you know, under under the fireside name. Well, right now we just opened our submissions. We are okay. doing submission periods. We were bugged for a whole year on when we were opening. So um, we have one right now, and we're forecasted to probably get one or two others. I'm talking to a friend of mine who has an author and what's traditionally published. So mm -hmm. we're trying to stay small because we want to focus on our authors. Our One of our mottos is we want our authors to feel like family. 
So we're not looking to get huge because we want to to be allowed to focus on them because we remember what it was like in an ocean, not knowing where to swim. (laughs) Like the Jerry Maguire motto, right? Like, yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Pretty much. Like being able to connect with that one client or two clients or however many it is and really just do the absolute best job for them possible humanly possible yeah definitely we don't want to get so big that our authors are like i thought you would help us and we're like you know what no we'll keep it small so right now we're probably looking maybe to add one or two more and then uh helping them out and uh, see how it goes from there so going from there what what is in the what is in the works right now I mean, you just opened submissions, so you have you have people sending stuff in, right? Are you are you both doing reads, read throughs? Are you are you both like we have to both agree on we want to help this person kind of deal? Yeah, this is we're a wholeheartedly a team. If one doesn't agree or starts questioning one of the manuscripts we receive, then we won't. We will not. We'll we'll try to either talk it out or we'll just turn it down flat because if we don't agree on the the author we're publishing, then there's going to be some friction when we try to market them. So um, right now we are very selective and I know that turns a lot of people away, but right, we have to be because unfortunately something we see a lot is a lack of quality. Mm-hmm. So we have to, we have to quarry, you have to quarry us unless we invite you. If we invite you, it's mm-hmm. a different story, yep. but you have to quarry us. And we have to read your pitch. Oftentimes, we can tell you can tell a publisher can tell an author's quality by reading their pitch. All right. So if we don't get a quality pitch, most of the time we'll just say we're sorry, work a couple of days, but th- uh, work a couple of years or so or whatever, and then come back to us. Or what we also do is we I'm a revision nut. I love to revise, so they're welcome to send me send me. The, oh, I've taught a class on it. Seriously, ask him. Yeah. So um. They're welcome to send me and say, hey, I really want to get published, but I don't know where to start. So I'm like, okay, here, let me let me help you as a away from Fireside, as a revisionist, let me help you as an editor, let me help you. Right. So it's not a matter of here's a rejection note, get lost. It's a matter of I, if you really want to do this and your manuscript is finished, let's look at it. Right. So there, and, and I talk to a lot of authors and a lot of them are in that querying process. And there's a lot of confusion. I feel like um, there's a lot of concern, like just fear of sending out their work. Or like, I, I think of anybody being rejected is scary, right? None of us want to feel like we're not good enough. What are some, what are some things uh, or tips that you have for people who are querying um, to make sure that they either include, like I, I've heard length, like differences in, in terms of how long the query should be, like what's included. Like, is there something in particular that you look for in a query um, to say yay or nay? Are there, like, some things that are hard breaks and you're like, there's no way because this was there, left out, or whatever? Well, I actually, it's funny you say that. I just did a workshop on quarrying <laughs> and pitching I just did a, as part of Nano <laughs> I just did a blog post on pitching. Okay. So, um okay. No, pitching is also a love of mine because it took a lot of research on figuring out how to do it. It really does. It's not a matter of, hey, my, my stuff is great. You should look at it. Right. First of all, we have to know what your book is about, okay? Don't just send us, oh, they, I won multiple awards I, in self-publishing, but now I'm ready to choose my publish. We will look at you and say, that's great. How's your story? <laughs> yeah, it's, not tr- it's not a trophy case, right? We're yeah, not, don't, not- don't, um, don't throw your book at us with, I... I won this award, this award, this award. It's like, that's great, Peaches. But that's also, we got a little bit of personal bias. You know, it's like, I bet your book is great to somebody. But it's different Stokes, friend, okay? Different Stokes. Okay, so you want to make sure that they're telling you exactly what their story's about, right? Uh, Yeah, like 150 words, that's it. It's like you would put on the back of your book. You don't put your entire story on the back of your book. You uh, include buzzwords, like keywords you'd put in your Amazon description to really get people to uh, look at your book. And then after that, what can we expect from your book? Is there an emotional ending? Is there a plot twist? Are we going to be left with a cliffhanger? You know, what can we expect? I think, and see, I think with that too, a lot of people get scared about, I don't want to give away too much, you know, like, I'm sure you've heard this too. It's like that fear of 
well, if I give you all the good stuff in my story, then there's no more secret for you to find out. You know what I mean? Okay, I will tell anyone thinking that right now, do not think that. If you are really <laughs> seriously quarrying us, we're the ones that need to know. <laughs> right. We need to know those things because we have to know this is a business, okay? Many authors take it personally when a publisher rejects them. But for us, we have to know it's marketability. If we can't market right. it, unfortunately, it hurts us too. So it's nothing personal. Please never take it personal because it's not. Well, so I, th I think they have to. we have to realize that it's different sending a query to a publisher than it is telling a friend or a potential reader what your story's about. Exactly. We want spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Send the spoilers. We need spoilers. <laughs> you need the spoilers. We okay. need the spoilers. <laughs> and uh, the 150 words thing is is interesting too because I've heard, like I said, that the lengths have differed for me. Like I've heard 150 words is, I've heard that from a couple different people is is enough. And I've also heard like two plus pages uh, is, you know, what you, you want to send as much as possible kind of deal, which I don't think if you're sending that much, if you have a publisher who's obviously looking at a lot of different manuscripts, they're not like they want to be caught quick. Right. And yes. they don't want to have to go through page after page of. We will automatically reject something like that. We just don't have to. <laughs> just say <like>, nope. <laughs> uh, that that. That is something, of course, again, if we reject you and you fix it, send it back to us. We're not going to close our door on one thing. Um, but we, a maximum for me, I really only want a page and a half, maximum. If you can squeeze it all on a page, thank you. But if you, it's a page and a half, that's fine. But please don't send us two, three, and four pages of, we just don't have time to read that. None of us do. Right. So, um, yeah, just keep it short, keep it sweet, because unfortunately, you're not going to have three and four pages to catch your potential reader. That's what the elevator pitch is for. You need to get something really quick to really grab them so they'll come talk to you. Either. Yeah. So mass that, is important. I think in today's age, too, it's like there's so much out there. Like you were talking about being in a sea of writers and a sea of, of published books. People can pick up and read whatever the heck they want. And if it doesn't catch them within like the first paragraph or, you know what I mean? They're just like, eh, I'll pick up this next book because there's so many, there's so many options out there. It, the magic, the magic number in the market nowadays is 1000 words. That's all you've got. If your hook is not strong enough, then they will close it. They won't even turn the back, the back of the book over if you can't catch them that way. Because um, it's like you said, the sea, there is a sea of books. However, you will always find readers, and that's what we we found interesting. Excuse us. Uh, we found interesting was we've always got readers to yeah. read. But the market is different, and this is where I often find many authors fail. Is they don't, sorry about that. That's they, okay. Uh, they don't, fall, they don't keep in touch with the market. There are two different markets, okay? Mm -hmm. There's the online market, and then there's the offline market. They are not the same. Okay. So um, the way we work is we follow both. So please, keep your quarry short because we get both both worlds. So we don't want a, a novel. Please don't give us a novel. <laughs> how, do you go, how do you go about attacking both worlds of the online and offline markets? Oh, we're hybrid. We're hybrid authors, and we're hybrid. We don't stay behind our, our computer. It's actually very rare that we even show any interest in the internet marketing world. And here's why: it's because the internet is seriously sat more saturated than your real world if you step away from it. And that's what we found. Yeah. So I don't. We don't spend much time on our computer, computer at all. The only thing we really do is say, okay, hey, if you want to find us, here's where you can find us. Otherwise, we're out and about at different different trade shows, uh, libraries, schools. We don't. We don't stay here. <laughs> wow, you put in a lot of foot, actual footwork. Oh yeah. yeah, lots of lots of driving hours. Um, so this this is something I think uh, very unique for uh, all indie authors because. We just don't know, right? Um, how to go about doing this stuff? How do you go about connecting with, with the the libraries, uh, 
going to different conventions or, or wherever like where where are you finding this information who are you going and talking to like what, what is your i want to know all your secrets <laughs> <laughs> Well, my friend, some of those are going to remain secret, but I will say I love this part of this, this uh, part of the company because, like I said, I love to travel, number okay, one. Okay. So I don't like to sit behind my computer when I, don't, when I don't have to. We have traveled out of state for this stuff. I'm telling you, we have gone to these libraries <laughs> because okay, okay. They are, the sooner you realize, and here's what I want authors to remember. Sending an email to the people who probably received multiple emails, and we all know the very famed spam folder, mm -hmm. go to these people, shake their hands, meet them, and say, would you be interested in if I, big D word, donated a copy of my book to your, your catalog? Mm. Oftentimes, we're going to be like, well, we don't know if we'll want to buy it yet. We want to review it. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't have to buy anything. Here is a copy of my yeah. book. You just put it on your shelf after your library board reviews it. And there, it's a lot of footwork. And I don't think indie authors recognize this. It's, it's really very, very small amount of sitting behind your laptop. It, you just can't. You can't. Yeah. I think that's the hope, though. It's like, <laughs> I think the dream is to be like, man, I'm going to write this book and be able to sit back and just watch the money roll in. But it's like, that doesn't happen at all. It does not, unfortunately. Um, we, we hear a lot of, like, we hear a lot of people say, oh, I want, I want to be the next J.K. Rowling. And here's the story. We have to look, we have to take ourselves out of context of today and put ourselves in the time when J.K. Rowling was publishing, okay? Mm -hmm. When J.K. Rowling published Harry Potter, there was nothing for young adults. Like, right. nothing. The young adult genre was limited to what the schools would let you read. Yeah. Hi, cat. Hey, um, cat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have to look at what was different then and what is different now. Right. So right. When, when Stephanie Mayer released Twilight... There was nothing paranormal romance for young adults. So when they saw this title, it was like, oh, my God, let me latch onto it right now. It was the same yeah. with Harry Potter, same with Stephen King. The market was not there for that particular brand, book, genre, whatever you want to say. So it is not the same now. You, you have to follow your market. And I think many authors are ignoring this big elephant in the room. You cannot just... Throw it up on Amazon and expect everything to come in and make your money as a writer. You're not going to do that. Yeah. It's it's just not I, I hate it when people say, Oh, I want to write to make money. It's like, well then you need to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you better write because you love doing it. Yeah, why write because you love doing it. And then and then write because you want to make money later. Right. But well, it's, it's, you have to almost like get lucky that what you're writing at the time falls in line with the market. If you're, if you're writing that what you love, because a lot of times, like I'm, I'm sure that was, uh, and for JK wrong and stuff like that, it was, and you've heard through multiple interviews, it's like, you know, it was an escape for her. It was like getting through depression and all kinds of stuff. Um, it was what she was dealing with and how she dealt with it. And, but it fell into that market. Exactly. At the time that it needed to be there. Exactly. And I, I see that a lot with like people um like the LGBT uh Q community and and writing uh those types of characters in the stories now, people are are doing it um to fit into the market because there's there's a huge grab for that. There is. The the passion has to be there. I, I'm a right. professional book reviewer. We have a review team. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, what we keep hearing is, unfortunately, I will put it out there, cookie cutter plots and right. flat characters. Right. We see it all too much. And that is the kind of thing that uh, we will reject. Because as much as I love a nice romance novel, there are, are only so many times I can see the big billionaire, bad alpha male rescue the poor little weak secretary. Okay. Right. I Please don't know more. Please change that. Take it, but run with it in a different way. I mean, there's a reason Fifty Shades became so big, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Please well, take it and run. And I think that it's like, um, 
it's great when those novels inspire us to do something, but when we simply just act on the same idea and try to write the same idea, then it's just copycat with different words, you know? Um, if it's not authentic, and I've, I've talked about this before, but like fiction is obviously something that's not real, but if, if it's going to be good fiction, it should be off, as authentic as possible to whoever, whoever's writing it, because if it's authentic to you, like if the fiction speaks to you in some way, then it's going to speak to somebody else. And that's writing with heart, I feel like. It is. If uh, one of uh, my mentors said, uh, what is his name? I can't remember his name. If he said, if you don't cry when you're in a sad scene, then there, then you don't need to write that scene. Yeah. If your heart doesn't break when you see that breakup, you're not writing right. Yeah. You have you have to elicit something in like I've literally he's caught me crying at my laptop when writing a scene. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. mean if if it's not doing that to you, then it's then it's empty and your readers will feel that. Yeah. Because they're getting the same way. I cannot tell you how many book bloggers I've reached out to that have said, okay, please no more of this. I get this too much. I mean, they will literally turn you away. And the thing is, is it's nothing personal to you. It's just they want to see something different. It's it's time to see something different. And see, so that's what's important, too, I think, about your message about there's no writer's block, because I feel like, and, and with revisions, I think it's just so important to, to speak on, too. We write the story, we write, and we put it out there, and we just get it out of us, right? It's not always going to elicit the emotion in us that we want it to, but as long as it's out there, it's almost like we're writing a, a rough, it's, it's just a rough draft, just get it out there. And so that we can come back to it with the revisions, right? And and hopefully fine tune it to a point where it does elicit the emotion that we were hoping to capture the first time. Because we don't always feel in that way. Hopefully we, we can, but it's so important to just write it and then allow the revisioning process and like editors and people like yourself to help fine tune it, correct? Yes, Editor, okay, I want to point out revision is not the same as editing. Okay. There is this huge big confusion that editing and revision are the same thing. They are not. Editing is taking care of the technicalities. Mm -hmm. Revision is fine tuning your story. Okay. Completely different opposite sides of the coin. So it is not, it is technically not an editor's job to revise your story. If they see a plot hole, yeah, that's, they're going to say, oh, hey, this is a huge plot hole, but that's a technicality. Right. That it's your job to tell the story because we can't tell your stories for you because like you said, it's inside of you. We don't right. know the background of what's going on inside you. You know these people. And that's why you'll never see us refer to uh, them as characters because they're people. Yeah. The more you make them real, and this is what I love about saying I'm not an author, I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Storytellers see people, authors see characters, and I like to break myself away from that. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a there's a huge need for storytellers out there. I think I've seen this a lot on social media um and some of the writing groups that I'm in this uh like these rules of writing that if it doesn't uh, attain to the certain gr grammatical rules immediately, then you don't need to be writing. You don't need to be put, putting your story out there. But like you said, that the the whole the grammar thing and like it's it that's an editor's job to find that stuff. It's more important that we find good storytellers and we allow people to become these good storytellers without the fear of being you know shunned for not knowing exactly where the freaking comma goes. And I've I've seen people say if you don't know this or this or this rule about grammar you shouldn't be writing and I think that's ridiculous. Well, let me as a professional book reviewer let me debunk that for you. Okay. Because as a publisher that's my responsibility to make sure that that's done. But right. as a book reviewer, if you have a few comments out of space, it's not going to bother me as long as your story is strong. I will never give a bad review based on technicality. Right. However, if it becomes a situation of neglect, then I'm going to email the author and say, okay, look, the story is great, or we're struggling a little bit, but you're neglecting this. This is not an accident. This is, where is your editor? <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, if it is a strong story, we're not going to look at your query letter and be like, oh my God, that comma. No, we're, we're going to be yeah. like, oh, this is an interesting story. Let me... Yeah. 
let me look into this. <laughs> but I think that's such an important distinction for writers or storytellers because I think they can get turned off from it. Um, and I've seen people literally afraid to put anything out there for that fear of, well, it's not perfect, you know. And they may be a fantastic storyteller, but because of that fear, that it's it, so it's important to have that distinction. It's like it, we're telling stories first and foremost, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't the be, the best thing that you can do is turn yourself away from being an author, and turn yourself to being a storyteller. Because in reality, in reality your first few books are going to be horrible. <laughs> Let's just put that out there. As yeah. truly, I look at Blessing of Luna now, and I'm like, oh, dear, sweet Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, wow. And that's why he's often said, are you going to make a version two? I said, no, because I see Blessing of Luna as my sketch. Yeah. So as I fine tune, I can look at book 12 and look back at book one, and it'll be like, oh, my gosh. Night and day difference. So I can see where I've become. So first thing I will say, authors, as a publisher, your first book is not going to be your best work. Okay. And it's okay. You can love it to death, but it's not going to be your best. It, it's just not. We didn't recognize Stephen King by his first novel. We recognized him when Pet Cemetery, Carrie, Misery, his fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth novels came out. That's when we started saying, oh, he's a storyteller. Yeah. I mean, you know. Heck, he even threw away Carrie. He didn't he, think it was any good. <laughs> you know? To this day, yeah. To this day, he will confess and say Pet Cemetery was pushing it too far. I thought it was a little unsafe. Yeah. That was uh, the reason why he published that one was interesting. He just needed to finish out a contract. It's like, I, <laughs> I got this one. Yeah. I don't want to publish it. I don't want anyone to read it because I think it's just that horrifying. He think he put, yeah. he thought he pushed the boundary with that one. But like there's out the contract. Here you go. Just, yeah, just here, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> right now, why you publish that? Um, oh yeah, his on writing. If you really want some encouragement, there are some books I can recommend later if you want. But um, seriously, Good. number one, don't. Something that I see a lot of as a reviewer is there's too much safety. Your people are broken. They're flawed. Let them be so. Um, Jim Butcher is a master of the flawed character. I'm sorry, Harry Dresden is one of the best flawed characters I've ever seen, but he's still a hero, and it's it's he's he like he likes everything a guy does. So I mean, it's like, oh wait, he's real. You know, this is a real person to me when I'm reading. He's funny. He's he's energetic. He gets beat up a lot. It's okay. Let them be who they are. Not everybody, like I said, has to be a bad boy billionaire alpha male. Okay, it's. Flaws, people. Flaws. <laughs> I think that's what we, we forget that. Was, that's what makes the greatest heroes are the people who, for some reason, even through all their flaws and imperfections and the millions of times they get absolutely destroyed, it's that one last time they rise up and win. It's exactly. like, whoa! <laughs> I can't believe he did it or she did it. It's, it's what blows our minds. That's what I love about Damien in my first book. His name is Damien. He's in the second one as well. Um, I get often told he acts like a 14-year-old child. Well, here's the story behind Damien. He suffered some really bad stuff as a child. He got hit by a car. He, uh, I mean, he, and he survived for reasons he didn't understand. So it's something, he has PTSD. And something we know from him being ex-military is PTSD does often you know, you go back to a place of safety, and that's what I get when I'm people like, why does he act like such a kid? It's like, because that's the time in his life yeah. when he remembered a veil of safety. It's it's a very natural flaw. It is a very human flaw, and I'm not going to apologize for him being flawed. Right. But so that's why I act like a three-year-old sometimes. You what? <laughs> that's why I act like a three-year-old sometimes. No, it's absolutely true. But it's the, and it's the beauty of it. I mean, I think... Um, that's what speaks to, to readers as well, because it's like, it's that authenticity that people can't connect to a perfect person. Like, I feel like, uh, if you look at in the comics, like Superman, he's, he's never, he's never been like a great movie or anything like that made with Superman. I mean, there's been some decent ones, but like, it's hard to tell a story about somebody who's so perfect, right? That it's like where there's no weakness here. I can't relate to this at all on any level, but you see somebody like, um, you know, even like Batman, you can still relate some to, you know, him losing his parents and all that kind of stuff and the heartache he goes through, even though he's a billionaire. Um, we want to be able to relate to these super powered, unbelievable characters. 
exactly. if they're perfect, you can't relate to them. Exactly. So perfect. He can be a bad boy billionaire, but what's really going on with him? Yeah. Obviously, he's, a, my- he's mentally insane. Like Batman is nuts. <laughs> oh, yeah. he's, he's very nuts. That, and that, but that's why you see so many people when you put a poll out there, or Batman or Superman, they're always going to go with Batman. They yeah. might not know why. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. But there's just something about him that attracts it. I'm a Batman. Completely told. Uh, will always support yeah. Batman. I'm because always- I can relate to that insanity of that, like, not being able to let go of something in my past that just, like, no matter what happens, it's going to drive me for the rest of my life. Like, just let it, let it go, bro. You know? <laughs> you just can't for some reason. Yeah. You see, there's The child sees this, and... Not even Batman at this point probably knows why he does it, but it's it's there. And yeah, that's what yeah. I love about flawed characters and what we look for is yeah. strong, flawed characters. And yeah. people who are suffering, but at the same time they go through their suffering. Right. Our recent author, Iona, has a – she posted her first quote on Instagram. And I kid you not, that thing exploded. And here's the first – here is the first quote of her – the first line of her novella. I want it known before I even begin this story. I am not the hero, but a villain. And I cannot tell you how many people reacted to this saying, oh, my God. <laughs> I need to read this book. <laughs> yeah. So the flaws. Flaws – Definitely show a character that's that's hurting and still still does what they do through their that hurt. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 an interesting it, it's an interesting piece of storytelling that it feels so obvious when we talk about it, but when you when you see so many stories that just don't have it, you're like, what? <laughs> Why is this missing so often? You yeah. Know? But even talking about it, it's like. I, I can feel the emotion behind it because it's such an exciting thing, you know, to to be able to relate to that kind of character. It is. And we that's probably where showing, not telling comes in. But here's the deal with that. That's another technicality. We won't yeah. throw your story out for that. But the beauty of it is, and this is what Stephen King does, is that he says, in the, I will write my, with myself in the same room, but once I'm done, I won't realize where I've been. Mm. And that's a storyteller. When you have yeah. no idea what you just wrote, you come back and read it, and you're like, did I write that? Yeah. That means you became your people, and you don't, right. you're don't. you telling their story. Because remember, yeah. it is their story. It's not yours. Anyone who writes a book will tell you, and a writer yeah. yourself, you've probably seen this. You have a plan in your head, but your character, your people are going to say, nope. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had that with my first book, and it just like it blew my mind. I knew where I wanted to go. And like the 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 villain who was supposed to be the villain ended up being like the father figure character who just like he just he just was that and I didn't want him to be that but I was just like son of a bitch <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna be that but it worked out so good you know it was just but it's also like letting the story happen you know getting out of getting out of the way and letting the story be told yes one of our one of my horror one of my favorite horror. Uh, Nava said this storytellers tell a story and I'm probably going to get a lot of people say something about this authors destroy it <laughs> and that's what he said and I'm like when I read that line I was like holy moly okay I mean it was a big revelation for me because he was so bold but yeah, um, yeah. he told this story I believe it was Clyde Barker probably actually said it I can't remember who it was but it was one of the top horror greats and he said this, and I was like, holy crap, that is really, really powerful. <laughs> yeah, because it's like we stop making the story about us, and we start making the story about the story. Exactly. It's like when, and like, I, I, I like when the uh, big time writers like J.K. Rowling and Stephen King use pen names um, to tell a story. And it's like they're just, they want to be, they don't want their name anymore to, to, mess up anybody's mind about what what they're actually writing they want to because there's still that in the back of their head probably thinking like well am i good anymore or am i because they want to know that they're still a good storyteller that is why iona will not appear in person and that is what she told us i do not want my name or my face to tell the story i want my novellas to be the reason people come back and see me 
I love that. So she is very adamant about not appearing in person. And I know that was painful for us, but it's it's like, I don't mind talking to people, you know. Sure, why not? I'll be yeah. the thing. Why not? So. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and if she's telling these amazing stories, that's, you know, that's what she's she's here to do, right? Yep. Yep, that's what she, she does. And I told her, I said, yeah. See, because I'm the weird duck. I will always tell anybody to ask me, which part do you like better, marketing or writing? And the big answer is, I love the marketing better than the writing. Wow. <laughs> I like the publishing <laughs> aspect better than the writing. So let, that's my love. <laughs> yeah. I think that's unique, though, that you also have the, the love for writing because it's uh, uh, being able to connect readers with storytellers is, oh. is your gift. That's what we want to do. We want to connect readers with stories. We don't want to connect them with books. Right. And that's another reason why Iona says she won't write series because, you know, it becomes a thing. I like series. I love the Harry Dresden books, but it, uh, Jim Butcher did a ma masterful thing. He actually didn't make it a series. He made it to where you can read each one on their own, but mm -hmm. he sprinkled in little tidbits of every right. other story. As a matter of fact, he said on one of his, his latest ones, it was called Changes. He said, Changes was not a cliffhanger. <laughs> So he said that, and it did, it did seem like a, a cliffhanger. Right. Looks, but um, she always says, I will not write a series. I just, I want to write standalones so people can speculate, so mm. people think, so people can build their own. Because not answering every question actually drives more talk. Yeah, because absolutely. People start forming theories, and you tap into a completely different group of people. Yep. yep. <laughs> I think that's one of the the uh, things that um, I hate, and we've thought we've talked about J.K. Rowling that, that she's been doing that I don't necessarily like is that she's answering too many of questions that nobody's been asking. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like nobody nobody needed to know, nobody wanted to know, but allowing other people to because there's so much fan fiction out there that grows up around the story that becomes a life of its own to multiple other generations after it if we just allow it to sit exactly if you answer every question it is it's actually a miracle harry has hung on as long as he has because i got that i got to book three and i couldn't finish i'm sorry because I was like, okay, now we're just, th and this is something that I think uh, Miss Rowling wanted to teach when she when she started writing under the new name. Um, yeah. She started experiencing, some, experiencing something called reader pleasing. Mm -hmm. And it's, she got so many people just, I need to know, I need to know, I need to know. So she kept writing past probably what she wanted to write. Yeah. And that's why she went under, probably why she went under the new name. To say, is this still something that I'm recognized for my story, or am I recognized just because of my name? And I don't want authors to think that series that you have to write a series to catch interest because you really don't. We've actually experienced, at least me, when I email book bloggers, actually experienced where they don't really want to read series. So it, again, it's all about knowing your market and not writing what is safe. Don't don't write your story to sell it because if you wrote it to sell it, then probably your readers are going to tell. But if you write it because you love it, they're going to be able to say, "Oh my gosh, I connect to that name brand." <laughs> yeah. Not really, not really a oh next book in the series, blah blah blah. Right. Yeah, those distinctions are definitely important. This has been incredible, very very informative. Um, so much amazing information. Uh, from from what you all are doing with Fireside Publishing, and, and and your books, it's so great that it's that out of that book and out of NaNoWriMo was born something that you're so passionate and love with a company that is on the rise for you. So I, I want to say congratulations to that for that. Thank you. Thank you. I actually, real quick, I can tell you where the name came from. Okay. And it it came from a love of. I could attach to as a child. I'm sure you're familiar with Charlie Brown Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was trying to come up with the name of this this company, I had no idea. I was lost. I went through a bunch of different names, and then that one line played "Yuletide by the Fireside," mm -hmm. and I was like, "That's it. That's, that's it. my name. That's my name." And that's really where it was. It was born out of passion. Wow. 
You can see it. I mean, from the way y'all talk about it, and and yeah, I mean, from what you're doing, you don't put in that much footwork and that much effort if you don't love what you're doing. You, right? I mean, because it costs money too. It's not like it's not like people are like giving you a, a boat, boatloads of money to show up at these libraries and do these things. It's like you you're putting in the work because you love it and you know it's it's worth something. Yes, and that yeah. speaks volumes. It can never be about money or it's shallow. The money is a perk. Your yeah. passion needs to be why you drive. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that for sure. I'm actually, uh, we set up, I, I'm supposed to be interviewing Iona too in like, I think a couple months. So yeah, I think she's in on July. in July, maybe I believe. Uh, yeah, I think it's set up on uh, the 29th of July. Yeah. yeah I'm excited I, to talk to yeah, her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to talk to her. I, it, it's been a pleasure getting to talk to you all. Um, I, I would leave you both with the final word, if you like. Um, Blaze, if you have something uh, that you want to leave the writing community or uh, write authors or storytellers with, and John, same for you. Um, well, one, one thing I would say is there's a lot of view of, oh, my gosh, the market is saturated, number one. Number two, yes, but every market is saturated. That's what you. That's what we fail to see. As someone who came out of the conceptual art and character design, that is a saturated and competitive market. But here's the thing. You can still find your readers, but you cannot find them by staying behind your laptop. They are not, the, they are no longer behind their laptops. They're out there. So you have to get up. It is work, first of all. You have to realize, it is work. You are a brand. And if you don't work, you will fall by the wayside. And that's not to scare you. But the truth is, it has to be about what you love first, because you have to, I always say, you have to bleed red before you can get into the black. And that's, the black is good in the business world. So right. for those yeah. who don't know, that's a good thing. So you have to bleed red before you, before you can make the black. Oh, I love it. Awesome. John? And from my side, if you happen to know someone who is passionate about these, about a project, a hobby or something, and just show support, even if it's just like answering a few questions here and there, because there are multiple times that boys here wanted to give up and kicked and screamed and just sounded like a child. <laughs> so there are plenty of times that happen. Just yeah. provide that support because there are a lot of times it's, it's worth helping those few moments so that they are able to go forward with something that they truly do care about. Yeah. It is trying, it is taxing, but in the end it is worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's just like what we talked about with the, the heroes, right? It's like, it's not because they just decided to give up one day. It's because even after all the heartache and failure and loss, they kept going. And those are the stories worth reading. Exactly. And it, it will come in this business. It will come a day like every business. Those who are not strong enough to keep up with the work will fall. It's, it's business 101. Don't take it personal. You, yeah. They will fall and the market will even itself out as every market has. So right. the longer you endure, the better you have to become that person that everybody knows but it might take a while. This is a long game. And what I will leave you with is a powerful quote by Pastor T.D. Jakes from his book called Soar. Mm -hmm. Eagles I'm don't learn to fly. Oh, he is. He's amazing. If you haven't read the book, Soar. It's called Soar. Okay. I tell you what, he's amazing. He said, eagles don't learn how, learn how to fly from the ground. They learn how to fly by jumping off a cliff and keep flying so they don't die. That's right. So That's you awesome. have to keep flying. That's right. Jump off that cliff. <laughs> jump. You have Go to jump. It. You got to jump. You have to trust, right? Yeah, you have to hit a few rocks. You're going to be beaten, battered, and bruised. But in the end, you're going to you're gonna be indoor and get that grit. You will yeah. be okay. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, Blaze, John, Fireside Publishing, thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. It was tr truly a pleasure to get to talk to both of you. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Yes, please do. Mm -hmm. I have you on Twitter, I think. <laughs> yeah, hit me up, Shouty. Definitely. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah. Beat me up, Shouty. See you later. <laughs> See you.